Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Mikkel Thorpe, and this is the Expat Money Show. Today's guest is an expert financial planner and the world's leading authority on integrating lifestyle goals and money goals without conflict. He teaches normal people how to seamlessly connect the science of financial planning with the joy of goal achievement. And he is passionate about education and world schooling with his own five children. Please welcome to the show, my dear friend, Joshua Sheets. Joshua, how are you? I'm doing well, Mikkel. Thank you for having me on. My pleasure. Now, I recently got to see you again last week at my birthday party. Now we're sitting down to record. We've spent a lot of time together this year and on multiple calls privately and on your amazing podcast. But before we kind of jump into today's topic, I kind of want to know, you know, how did you get into this field? You know, how did you end up getting so passionate about this type of work? I began my career working in the corporate environment and then quickly discovered that I didn't want to sit behind one desk in the same place every single day. After getting laid off from a job, I wound up starting to work as a traditional financial planner, did that for six years, but I grew frustrated with the voices that were out there on the internet with regard to financial planning. I had done a lot of formal study and preparation, gotten a master's degree in financial planning, a bunch of financial planning designations, and I would find myself shaking my fist at <laughs> the radio while I would drive around listening to Dave Ramsey or some podcaster. And so one day I sat down on my bed with just a simple voice recorder, hit record and spoke for 45 minutes. And lo and behold, that was episode one of what ultimately became radical personal finance. I ended up leaving my financial planning business in order to start the podcast and to teach people about financial planning instead of doing it in the product sales category. And here we are 10 years later, I've recorded a thousand episodes of radical personal finance. And it's been an extremely gratifying experience because the business has allowed me to make a living from a laptop wherever I can have an internet connection. And in so doing, I've traveled the United States, living full-time in an RV. My wife and I left the United States, living kind of an expat, nomad, uh, kind of perpetual tourist lifestyle for a number of years. We have five children now, and it's been quite the adventure. It's amazing. And, you know, we were chit-chatting before the episode and we thought, all right, what are we going to talk about? And obviously, you know, this is the expat money show and we talk finance and investing on all of these types of things. And you've done a thousand episodes of your show, but I was going, I bet you Joshua, wanna, Joshua wants to talk about something else. So that's what we're going to do today. We're actually going to not discuss financial matters. We're actually going to discuss world schooling and education for kids because we are both proud fathers and you got five kids. I've got two soon to be three kids. So you know, this is a topic I think that's really important to us. Why did you decide that you weren't going to put your kids in just traditional state run, normal, normal, quote unquote, education? I probably have an extremely unusual story with regard to that question. I'm the only person I know, other than perhaps you, Miguel, <laughs> I'm one of the only people that I know who has simply always accepted it as fact that when I had children, I would teach them. I would home educate them in some way, shape, or form. I was homeschooled as a child up until the age of seventh grade, with, with the exception of third grade when I attended a government school in third grade. And then in seventh grade, I went into kind of a traditional mainstream uh, private Christian school where I spent seven years or five years and graduated and then went to a university and, and beyond and in kind of the normal pathway. What I observed was even though I had technically only been homeschooled for six years, and even though my homeschooling was rather conventional, it was nothing like the way that I teach my children, I observed that that formation in my life was extremely powerful. And I always found school easy. Academics came extremely easily to me. But more importantly, those early seven years had allowed me to basically keep the spark of loving learning. My observation as a teen even was that an average five or six-year-old who goes into kindergarten or first grade loves to learn, is super passionate about learning opportunities, wanting to learn everything about everything. And then if you go and look at your average 18 year old graduating from a standard industrial school, it seems like something has dramatically changed. All of the joy of learning, all of the enthusiasm and zeal has disappeared. And 
it's been replaced with a surly, unpleasant 18 year old. Now, perhaps that's not all related to the school system, but I became very well convinced even as a 15 year old and an 18 year old that the industrial school model does not have the long-term best interest of the child as its aim. And so even when I was a young man prior to being married, this has always been a hobby of mine, researching the school system, trying to understand why the world works the way it is, learning about ideas of how it can be done better. So before my wife and I ever had children, I had a few curricula picked out that I thought would be really interesting. And now I have a laboratory of five young children that I can test all my ideas, <laughs> track the results, see what works and what doesn't. Well, see, I think this is super interesting and a very valid point because, you know, I think the majority of the people who listen to my program know my backstory. You know, I had a learning disability. I was dyslexic. I went to a special school. I had a horrendous experience. I stopped going to school at 12 and officially dropped out at 15. And I consider myself, I don't consider myself homeschooled. I absolutely consider myself self-taught or an autodidact. And I subsequently never lost the curiosity or the spark for learning. And I think about other kids that I went to school with, and I still keep in touch with some people that I've known since I was four or five years old. And I don't think they've read a book since they left college or high school, right? And I know you're a voracious reader and you're very much a proponent for advanced reading and the benefits of such. And so am I. I read over a hundred books a year from some high school dropout dyslexic kid but, you know, it's like, all right, if I can do it, if if I can read this much and still have such a passion for education, you know, why is that so? Why is that change there in you and in me, but not in the general public? At its core, I hate to, I'm going to, this is going to sound like, in essence, a conspiracy theory. But we love conspiracy a, theories, by the way. Right. We can absolutely go down the rabbit hole on this program. You're in good company here, my friend. At its core, when you start to study the history of schooling, it's very difficult to find any evidence that education is the primary aim of schooling. On the contrary, schooling, the way it's designed and implemented and especially over the last about 80 years, is primarily designed to modify behavior of the population. And so there are some important historical ties to the modern, what I call industrial school system. And let me define my terms. Uh, when I refer to government schools, I specifically mean schools that are run by the government. Public schools is what they're called in the United States, private schools, I think, in England. Uh, but government schools, so the government schools that children go through that are paid by taxpayer dollars, those are almost all just standard industrial schools. But there are many private schools, meaning parents pay tuition payments for their children to attend a certain school. And many of those those private schools function in basically the same way as the government school. That was my schooling experience. In seventh grade, I went to a large, well-known private Christian school, but there was no real functional difference in the actual system of the way the classrooms were run as compared to the standard government school. The only difference was that we prayed in class and we had a Bible class and it really functionally wasn't different. Now you could contrast that with something like what is quite popular today in the elementary school ages is the Montessori schools. Montessori schools are not industrial schools. And there are many experiments being done, many strong established schools that are private schools, that are cooperatives, and these are not industrial schools. So when I say industrial schools, what you should picture is basically students lining up, 30 of them in seats and rows, all facing forward to see the teacher lecture, uh, moving from class to class every 45 minutes or every hour with a bed that rings to let you know you have four minutes to get to your next class and where everyone is moving through the same curriculum at the same pace, kind of this industrialized model. That industrial model of schooling, the highest education and ambition that it had was to produce workers who were competent to read instructions and follow instructions. And it's in essence a factory system of schooling that was designed to serve a factory system of 
of an economy, a factory economy. And so you needed students who were conditioned in order to follow rules, come when the bell rings, do what the foreman standing in front of the shop line says to do. And in addition, then you can go into basically the behavior management of the population and say that in essence, what the government officials want is a homogenous population because a homogenous population of people that all think the same way leads to much easier government than does a population filled with free thinkers, people who consider things for themselves and come to their own conclusion. And then again, there's also business interests that ideally, from a corporate perspective, if you're running a large corporation, it would be ideal to have a large homogenous population of people that all think the same way so that it makes your marketing efforts fairly straightforward, that you can sell to most people in a similar way. None of that is based upon educational advancement for the individual. So if you flip things on its head and you say, what is the best for this child, my child, who I care about, then now it, you can design something that is ideal for this child. It's hard, but it's much more powerful. And at its core, the modern industrial school system has never been designed about that. There are models in which you can have broad education. So the classical American model of the one-room schoolhouse was not an industrial school system. In fact, students in that system all passed forward at an individualized rate, and it produced some of the greatest generations in American history. But that model was replaced uh, within the last century, and now we see a very homogenous population that is easy to market to and easy to govern. So here's the first way, the first place that my brain goes to on this, because if we are going to have this group of homogenous, as you called, sheeple type of populace, and the U.S. is known for creativity and entrepreneurship and building things. What do you think is going to happen in the future with our human capital if we're literally training everybody to think and feel and behave the same way? How are we going to have industry leaders and CEOs and people to be able to take society to the next level? Like, where are those people are going to come from? I think it's a balancing act. First, we should acknowledge that there are many bright people who escape from the industrial school system. You're an example of that. You escaped. You wouldn't have thought it at the time. You would have said, well, I'm having a really hard time with my dyslexia. But in reality, you came through that system and you escaped. And so there are always in every system, there is always a population of mavericks who kind of get through. And so to say that the industrial school system destroys all people is not true. There are often mavericks at the very high end of intelligence and achievement who don't have any trouble with academics. They just get things done quickly. And then there are often many mavericks who are not skilled with academics and they just don't care. They get through somehow and they make it. The biggest challenge is that middle zone of people who are not at either extreme and yet they find themselves dulled and their love of learning dulled by it. What I observe, however, is that it doesn't seem to be a terminal, a terminal condition. Uh, schooling may have significant impact on people, significant even negative impact. But where I first remember this is when I got to college and I was freed from the very small social environment of high school. And all of a sudden I realized that in college, everybody can find their niche and you can discover that, hey, if I'm a theater kid, there's other theater kids and we can really enjoy being together. We don't have to be picked on by the football jocks. And if I'm a football jock, then I can find other people who like what I do. And so that's where you start to see it. And then once people get out of university, then they can congregate with people who are like them, who they enjoy spending time with. And in many ways, they do often recover from the trauma of their school experience. On the whole, though, it's interesting. I read a book recently by an educational guy named Hirsch, E.D. Hirsch, something like that. And the book was on the knowledge gap. And he, in that book, traced some of the comparisons between the U.S. American school system and the Chinese school system. And it's quite interesting that the Chinese school system is vastly superior in the current scenario to the U.S. American system in terms of technical accomplishment, basically the STEM fields, uh, mathematics better, engineering better, all of those things better. But it's woefully inadequate to creating the 
free thinkers that the United States culture is able to create. And so my answer to that is there are enough vestiges in the U.S. American culture broadly of valuing individualism, cowboy culture, and that students who are raised in the United States absorb that cultural milieu, and it hasn't yet been entirely stamped out of them by the industrial school system. But there is a dramatic difference. If you went back 75 years ago, you would see a big difference from today, and I fear to think where things would be in 50 to 75 years if we didn't have, for example, an enormous growth of homeschooling in the United States, an enormous growth of these other non-industrial school models that are extremely popular and normal uh, among affluent, educated people now. Well, I see with a lot of people who are moving into the homeschooling movement, and you'll probably be able to comment on this as coming from a Christian background, is a lot of the woke agenda that we're seeing in public education right now, which I find is very, very weird and wacky and bizarre. And I really don't understand where a lot of these ideas have any place in a children's, a child's life, you know, and I'm trying to figure out like, what is it that they're trying to do by sexualization of children and this transgender uh, agenda that's going through right now that really confuses kids in a very, very, um, sensitive time in their life. Do you have any thoughts on why this is coming through? Because it's not by accident. I mean, it is absolutely rammed down their throat. And I think that it's it's a fair statement that it is happening across Canada and the United States throughout public education. The philosophical model that to me makes sense, and I would affirm the statement I'm about to make, but I also recognize that it's not widely discussed as simply this. Education is always religious in nature. And so I would characterize woke culture or wokeism as a religion. It is a religious ideology that seeks to answer some of the great questions that all religions seek to answer. And all education is necessarily religious. It is a form of indoctrination. That makes many people uncomfortable, especially if someone is uh, not really a religious person. I'm kind of a secular kind of free thinking person. But at, at the end of the day, I've come to the conclusion that you can't be religiously neutral. And so in homeschooling, for example, quick backstory on the history of, of home education. Obviously, there's a long history of home education throughout all of culture. Uh, the wealthy have always had private tutors for their children, and that's an, a variation of home education. But then in the United States, an enormous change happened after the institution of the progressive school system in the mid 20th century. And the first people to rebel against it were not right wing religious Christian conservatives. On the contrary, it was very left wing liberal people. And the reason is that at the time, religious conservatives were very confident that their children were getting a great education in the government schools and there was no need to change. If you go back and you read some of the writings of the early progressive education pioneers, John Dewey being the most famous, but not the only one by any means, what you see is that Dewey had a specific religious goal with changing the character of American educational systems. He wanted to accomplish salvation by education. His idea was that if we can educate our children properly, then we can get rid of all of the toxic, pardon the word sin, but it's specifically what he's trying to do, the toxic sin that exists in culture. And he didn't believe in the classical Christian or religious concept of sin, but he was trying to educate people so that there can be, in essence, a religious uh, achievement. That was the goal of the progressive education system. What happened is it took several decades, and then conservative Christians started to catch on to what was happening. And they said, wait a second, there's a religious counter revival happening in the school that goes against what our religious ideology is. And they started to protect themselves against it by moving into the homeschooling space, following the hippies in the direction of homeschooling. In the 1970s and 1980s, there was an enormous series of legal battles in the United States over the legality of homeschooling. My parents homeschooled their children at a time when the legality was questionable. It wasn't clearly winnable. However, then there were a series of court opinions that guaranteed, no, indeed, 
parents have the right to educate their children as they see fit. And that's a movement that has grown dramatically over the last few decades. And it has been heavily dominated by religious Christians who observed that the ideology that was being instructed towards children in the government schools was dramatically opposed to the ideology that they wanted their children to have. And for many decades, even in Christian spaces, there were all kinds of arguments. Oh, it's not so bad. It's not so bad. It's been within about the last 10 years and certainly the last five years since the coronavirus pandemic, when now basically that's all gone. And so that's one of the reasons that homeschooling is, is uh, grown so much. The book that I would suggest that I think describes this the most clearly is a little known book on education written by a man named RJ Rushdoony. And he wrote a book called The Messianic Character of American Education. Rushdoony was a stalwart Christian who was writing from an explicitly Christian perspective, but he traces in excruciating detail the what he labeled the book as the messianic character of American education, the specific writings of the progressives. And so my answer is that wokeism is a religion that is seeking to answer many of the great religious questions that all religions seek to answer. And all you can take any religion, whether it's Christianity, Islam, Judaism, all religions have a set of questions they try to answer, and wokeism answers those, but with woke ideology. And so it's a necessary religious conflict, because when you're instructing children, you are necessarily imparting to them a pathway to solve the great questions of life. Now, there are there are there there is an element in which those of us who care about freedom, liberty, uh, serious questioning, et cetera, we want to impart those values to our students and we work very diligently to do that. But at the end of the day, that expression cannot be religiously neutral. That's, that's how I see it is there is no op there's no ability for religious neutrality. Education is always religious in nature. The question is who is the religious authority that is controlling it and how will they design and deliver a broad based worldview to a student to consider? I hear exactly what you're saying, and I think it's a fantastic explanation. The questions, though, of how they're answering the large philosophical questions, I still don't understand of the perverse nature that I see in a lot of this woke ideology and questions that I don't think are appropriate, certainly for my children at this age. And I'm not here to judge any other parent or how they're going to judge their children or educate their children. But I would encourage people to pay attention what's happening in public education and conversations that are happening, which for me would be a completely inappropriate uh, age level for these types of things. Yeah, I'm 100% on board with you and wholeheartedly agree with you. I think that's why the COVID pandemic has turned out to be an incredible boon to the world of not only home education, but even private schools. I follow some of the statistics and the percentage of U.S. Americans, where I know the data most well, who homeschool is at record levels. But it's not only homeschooling. The growth in the classical school model is through the roof. Most classical schools, uh, classical Christian schools and classical schools have waiting lists that are a mile long. And it comes from parents recognizing, wait a second, these teachers and this curriculum is genuinely trying to groom my child, is genuinely trying to create an environment where a stranger imposes a sexual ideology into my child. And so people are starting to wake up to, up to it in a significant way. I would say that I don't want to hammer too broadly and talk too much about wokeism, but what you see is if you understand the objective of the religious ideology behind it, which is basically has as its highest good personal self-expression, that the self is always the best and highest good, and the fullest expression of the self is always the best and highest good. And you understand the emotions that come with sexual expression, the feelings, the emotions, which are some of the most intense the human experiences, then you understand why one of the highest sacraments of woke ideology is sexual expression. And that's the most visible expression of it. It goes much beyond that. It's not only about sexual expression, but that is a core component of the overall ideology of how it answers the big questions of life.
Well, it's interesting too, because as you pointed out, not just homeschooling is growing, but Christian schools, Catholic schools, things like that. Now, Christian schools and Catholic schools are not going to have that same type of woke ideology, but they still are going to have a lot of what we, what you classified as industrialized school. I would just call state-run school type of mentality. So do you think that people are not aware of the dangers of this side of public education as well, and that they're still getting it in a religious school context, or do you think they don't care about it? Or what's your thoughts and feelings about that? I would say it's two different directions. So we could use, for example, well, let's, let's start with kind of the, the, why I specified the concept of an industrial school and why I described the school that I attended in the way that I did. It was an industrial school, but what they tried to do at the time was bring in more elements of Christianity. It wasn't a genuinely authentic, deep, overarching Christian worldview in every area. On the, on the contrary, it was a lot of just standard textbooks and kind of a standard approach to education. But as I said, we prayed before class. And when we talked about evolution, we talked about evolution and creation together. It wasn't just all evolution. We, we dealt with both. Now, you can have secular models that don't dig into deep religious ideology, but on the contrary, don't follow the industrial school system. So there are a number of educational creators. I followed a number of years ago, Elon Musk started a school for his children, and I followed those, that project very closely. There are many modern educators who are trying to develop new ideas, and none of their approaches are industrial. They're all different, but none of them are religious. So the concept between an industrial educational model and a personalized educational model is a separate factor. Now, coming over here to the religious ideology, met the other trend that has happened in Christian schools, Catholic schools, and other religious institutions is that what we discovered is that for those of us who wish to impart our personal religious beliefs and ideology to our children, we discovered that that wasn't that they weren't very sticky. And what happened to an enormous generation before me and alongside of me is that you had Christian elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools that would raise children up, and they had this kind of lightweight standard industrial education with a lightweight Christianity, and then we would send our children off into a, an Ivy League school or into an educational institution, and our children would be confronted with the secular humanist ideology, and we would all of a sudden find that a professor was able to eviscerate the faith of our good Christian child. And this resulted and still results in an enormous number of young Christians abandoning their Christian ideology, becoming secular, joining the nuns, as in no religious belief, no, no particular religious belief. So there's been a simultaneous movement that has happened in religious schools to say, what we're doing isn't working. And it's not that we're abandoning Christianity, but that we need to go much deeper in an educational model and perspective. And we can't just take a bunch of standard textbooks in an industrial system and talk about God. That doesn't work. On the contrary, we need to go much deeper from an educational perspective, and we need to have a genuine, deep, comprehensive Christian philosophy of education. And that's where, if you go and you look at right now, the classical Christian school movement is perhaps the most visible expression of that. The classical Christian school movement doesn't sacrifice some of the industrial system in the sense that it's not that we all come in and lounge around on the floor. No, we have desks and we do things studiously. But on the contrary, the entire educational curriculum, instead of being formed with the basic secular humanist ambition of being able to pass a bunch of exams, on the contrary, the entire curriculum is being redesigned and has been redesigned from the various earliest ages to the end ages to deal with a focus on what is good, what is beautiful, what is virtue on a very deep level. And so that's a separate movement. And those things can be combined, they can be pulled apart, uh, and you have to pay attention to both of them because it's not strictly religious and it's not strictly industrial versus personalized. But when those things come together, I think you see some of the most exciting and interesting expressions of a well-educated student.
So with all of your background, you've seen state-run schools, you've seen Christian schools, you've done a ton of education. How come you are not following a classical Christian schooling system for your five children? Beautiful question. <laughs> First of all, <laughs> whenever I talk about education at all, I want to build some foundational ground, ground rule suggestions. The most important of which is that as a parent, it is your responsibility and my responsibility to look at this individual child and ask myself, what is best for this individual child? And also, what is best for this individual child right now? We can and should develop a large overview philosophy of what we think is generally good for children, but we should always be committed to what is best for this child right now. And so I'll describe in as much detail as you give me time for what I'm doing right now, but I want to always preface that with what I'm doing with my child may be different than what you should do with your child. And what I'm doing with my child today may be different than what I do with my child a year from now. And, and probably if we have that different children get different aspects. I've met your children. They're brilliant. They're amazing to spend time with. But my guess would be that each one of the children has a slightly different way that you communicate and teach and interact with them. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. A little anecdote of what I've learned about having five children now. When I was a father of one, I had all of my parenting philosophy buttoned up. I knew exactly wow. what I was doing and why <laughs> I was doing it. I was ready to instruct the world on parenting philosophies. I had a second child. I still felt pretty good about what I was doing, but I had a few cracks in the armor. Third child came along and third child was so dramatically different than any of my other two child that I started to close my mouth. And now with five children, I'm very skeptical of ever wanting to give parenting advice to anybody because you realize how unique and different each individual child is. And I think the same expression should be there with regard to education, that we want to build educational models, but we want to be thoughtful in what's working for this child right now. And we want to bring personalization to a child. And so a properly formed school career will often look different at many different stages. You may do one thing at kindergarten. You may homeschool your kindergartner. You may send your second grader to a local government school because it's a perfect fit for right now. In fifth grade, you may homeschool again for a few years, and then you find a wonderful classical school or online school or something. And we want to reflect, our, we should tailor the education to where the child is now and where the child's strengths and weaknesses are. On the whole, though, I have always felt that homeschooling, some expression of homeschooling, is the best for the early years because it enhances and focuses on a few things. Number one, one of the primary values that I want to impart to my children is the importance of our family unit. And when I think about the number of hours that we take young children out of the family and put them somewhere else, we should be very cautious about breaking up the family unit. In the United States, for example, in the culture that I know, children are routinely institutionalized from a very early age. And as I see it, it's one of the reasons why the children turn around and institutionalize their parents at a fairly early age. And the relationships are largely broken. And I have never wanted that. I've always wanted strong relationships with my children. And relationships are built on the currency of T-I-M-E. It's time. And so one of the things that I value enormously about my lifestyle is that my wife and I are physically present with our children between the couple, uh, 100 and basically 65 hours a week. And one of us is with our children with the exception of a few hours a week. Now, I don't, I'm not saying that the ideal standard of time together with children is 168 hours a week, and you're totally wrong if your children are at 30 week, 30 hours a week of activities. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is we should measure the amount of time that we spend with our children in our family unit. And if we want to build a strong family unit, 
it's going to require time. And so I value the time together. The next reason that I think homeschooling is ideal at an early stage comes down to what does a good education consist of? And a good education or a full proper education is not exclusively academics, nor is it even primarily academics. On the contrary, a proper education should include as a strong foundation things like character education. So the most valuable thing that we want to impart to children is character formation. And that character formation comes in many senses. There's many expressions of character that we want to build. But most character instruction involves instruction that is caught, not taught. And in order to catch character instruction, we need to be in an environment in which we can give that instruction and then have time for it to be worked out. So if we can, say, produce a 10-year-old, and let's assume for the moment, this is not the case, but let's assume that we could choose between two 10-year-olds. 10-year-old one was a 10-year-old of enormously strong character. Uh, was this 10-year-old knew how to manage his emotions. He knew how to treat other people with kindness and respect. He knew how to flow smoothly in a family unit. He was skilled at helping uh, contribute to the family team. Uh, all of the simple graces of good manners and, and proper interaction among human beings. And he knew how to discipline himself to do things that were hard. And he had had 10 years of character formation. But he had zero academic knowledge. He couldn't read, couldn't write, couldn't do math. He was academically incompetent. On the other hand, we had a 10-year-old who had the height of academics, but had no character, no self-management skills, no personal discipline, no respect for other human beings. Which of those children would you rather choose to work with at 10 years old? I'm going to choose the character one every day because in about a month, we can teach the 10-year-old to write, sorry, to read and to write. In about probably three months, we can catch up five years of missed mathematics. We can solve academics incredibly fast, but we can't solve character issues incredibly fast. And so if we don't form character effectively at a young age and we wind up with a 10-year-old who is sitting all his time in an institution learning not not only not learning proper social skills and character skills, but on the contrary, being taught bad skills, being taught negative examples, being taught to be disrespectful to people, being taught to not discipline himself, to discipline his emotions and his actions. We've got a crisis on our hands and we can't easily change that. So I'll pause there, but that should be the foundation that we work with. And in order to do character education and to build a strong family unit, we need time. I think that makes so much sense. And really to hammer home what you're talking about, I've actually gone out there and looked up the statistics on something like learning how to read. It takes about 100 hours to learn how to read at, a, at quite a good level. 100 hours, that's it. That is something that actually can be done very fast in, in the relevant, relevant terms of, of doing something. And, and you and I have had many conversations about languages. And actually, I hope that in today's conversation, we can touch on language learning. You know, I went out there and I found out that it takes on average, you know, around 450 to, I think it was 450 uh, hours, 450 to 500 hours to learn what would be considered a level one language like Spanish, French, Portuguese, Romanian, these types of romance languages, assuming that you're coming from an English background. So that's very easy for me to then plan out. All right, I want my child to learn another language. This is how much language studying it's going to take. And we build it into a curriculum. And 12 months later, child can speak that language. I have multilingual children and you have multilingual children. But absolutely, character is something that is going to take a lot of time to build. Now, when I'm looking at education, what we do, you know, you know, when we're using the, the phrase homeschooling, I think, you know, we can both agree it's kind of an umbrella term for everything, which is just not formal state run type of education. If we want to get a little bit more granular, I probably follow what's more closely related to unschooling, right? I don't do a formalized curriculum in a lot of cases, but what I am doing is interest-based learning and I am constantly looking for opportunities where my child can learn and we can help educate them. So examples in everyday life, it doesn't matter if it's first thing in the morning or if it's at midnight, 
I want to try to find things that happen in our lives. And a lot of those are absolutely character building exercises. And when I travel with my children, we're not in the quote unquote perfect environment. You know, they're not at a desk. We don't have a whiteboard in front of us. They're not sat down to learn. But that doesn't mean they're not learning. Actually, in those instances, when you're a little bit tired or you're a little bit hungry or something is going on that's unexpected or you're meeting new people in different languages on the other side of the world, those types of examples of learning uh, are absolutely unbelievable. And I think that everyone will agree with me that although they might be difficult, it will definitely build your character and your child's character. When you look at the issue of time, even to the previous conversation, I think it's such a powerful illustration that the school system is not primarily about education. My observation from listening to a lot of homeschoolers who follow what I'm just going to call a fairly standard curriculum, not necessarily what I do or what you do, but a fairly just standard grade level curriculum. They go and they buy a packaged curriculum from somebody who makes workbooks and they take their children through the standard workbooks that would be analogous to what third grader in a government school might be taken through. What they find is that usually you need about an hour and a half to two hours, sometimes as much as two and a half hours, but about two hours a day over the course of about 180 days a year. And the child can handle all of his curriculum duties in that context. If that's a normal experience for average homeschoolers, not especially bright people or any kind of weird things, then you ask yourself, what on earth are they doing with my child for six hours a day, eight hours a day, 10 hours a day? Right. And so you realize you can do a lot. And when you free that time up, I'm convinced that the basic thing we should always calculate in life is the opportunity cost. What is my child giving up by being in a government school? So I would say it's some of these alternative learning opportunities like you're describing. Last year, I took my wife and our five children to a total of 16 countries, Amazing. countries as, diver as diverse as uh, we went to Cuba. We, which was probably kind of the poorest and most difficult place that we traveled to. We traveled all over Europe and we we're in France and Germany and all these different places. And so those kinds of experiences, I think, are dramatically important in the long-term outcome of a child. And one of the reasons earlier you asked me, why do I homeschool? I homeschool because I want it all. So academics are extremely important to me. I have spent a lot of time thinking about, are academics important? Maybe they're not so important. Maybe we should just cater to the exclusively to the interests of the child. At the moment, I have generally rejected that philosophy. I think that academics are extremely important. But on the flip side, academics are not the only thing. Although I believe in the value of strong academics, I don't believe that strong academics are in any way sufficient. And so if we look at a child's lifetime, the average child spends somewhere between 15 to 18,000 hours in school. I personally prefer, so even if we just look at that, wow, that's an enormous amount of time that we can do a lot of things. In a moment, I'll look up my calculations on language learning when we get to that conversation because I did these calculations to figure out how many languages a child could learn. It's astonishing what you could do with just that 15 to 18,000 hours that a child has available. I have also done the calculations of how much time does a child have available, even if we're not just talking about standard school time. And the reality is that children have something like 50 to 60,000 hours that we can direct in an intelligent way to help children to advance far beyond what a child otherwise does. And I'm not interested I'm sorry to have to make you know disclaimers, but they are important because I know where people's mind go. I'm not interested in being a tiger dad and saying, you're going to do math every single hour of every day. I believe play is enormously important. Self-directed interest-based exploration is enormously important. All of these things are important. But as parents, we can build a, a strong environment that exclusively has positive options available. And by controlling the environment of our child, our child will naturally be inclined to go to positive things. Here's one practical example. When my older children were younger, we practiced zero screen time. 
not judging anybody who doesn't do that. That was the decision that we made. We found it was easier just to do zero screen time. And then what happened is a few years ago, I discovered that, you know, wait, what? Something is not going right here. And specifically what it was, was on the topic of movies. We never watched movies with the children. They didn't watch movies. We didn't watch movies. We played games. We did all kinds of things. We just didn't do movies because we didn't do any screen time. And then I found that my children had somehow, not for me, of course, I mean, I never said anything about it, but they'd absorbed this idea that movies are bad. And they talked about, well, movies are bad. I was like, movies aren't bad. Obviously, you want to make good choices, but movies aren't bad. And I realized that somehow we had done something wrong. And so my wife and I started to bring in screen time and we started to watch movies. We started watching one movie every week to make sure that we got rid of this ideology that, well, that person's watching a movie and movies are bad. But we still were pretty light on, on apps. Then I started to bring in some apps, different things. What I discovered is that because I had been thoughtful about it, I was able to manipulate the environment so that watching movies was something that was positive. Not only was it positive for the enjoyment factor, but early on I decided, you know what, if we're going to watch a movie, we're just there's no point in watching a movie in English. Why not watch a movie in one of our languages? And so the three languages that my children all know are Spanish, French, and German. And so I just made a rule that we never watch movies in English unless it is absolutely necessary for the language or it, we're watching a movie as a special family time, something like Cool Runnings or Home Alone. You know, Home Alone needs to be done in English. Cool Runnings needs to be done in English to get the full effect of some of these classic movies. But beyond that, my children watch two movies a week, sometimes three, and they're always in another language. And what has happened is here's this escape, but instead of it just being pure entertainment, pure dead time, they're getting all of the benefits of entertainment mixed with language immersion. And it wasn't hard. They don't even ask. They just assume that we're going to be watching a movie in one of our languages. Another example was when I started to introduce apps. I wanted my children to learn music. Music is very important for education. It's one of the few things that's proven to increase IQ. It enhances thinking ability. It's a really important component. But I failed for three years. I hired a piano teacher for my oldest child. It was just a failure. I hired a different teacher. Failure, failure, failure all the way through. And I was so frustrated by it. I had this piano in my house that I'd gone out and bought a piano and it was a complete failure. And so about six months ago, I was determined this is going to change. And I decided, you know what? I'm going to try an app. Maybe an app will be the solution that we need. And so I tested a couple different apps and I chose the Simply Piano app. And I put it on the iPad and I had the children start playing with it. I started playing with it as well. Simply Piano was an entirely transformative experience for my piano. That The piano went from nobody touching it at all to now my elder four children fight about who gets to play piano. And it's going all day long. My wife and I had to move it into a back room where we could close the door because it was just going all day long. And it's funny to me because as best I can tell, my children get just as much enjoyment of playing the Simply Piano app as they do, as they would with any, I don't know, Minecraft or anything else. And I'm not insulting any games. What I'm saying is that they get as much enjoyment from this thing that's also teaching them music. And they've made enormous progress faster than I ever would have dreamed of in their musical abilities simply by having a positive environment. And so as a father, I look at it and I say, we've got about 50,000 hours to work with. What are the things that we want to accomplish in this 50,000 hours? What are those things that are foundational of academic abilities? But more importantly, what are some of those specific skills that we want our children to have so that when they go out in the world at 16, 18, 20 years old, that they're extremely competent and they have the confidence that comes from hard won competence. And what are those skills that cover over of many different areas? And so this this is one of my primary hobbies is trying to enumerate those skills. What are those skills that will be useful in all different areas? And then how can we find ways to acquire and develop those skills that are pure enjoyment? Because while I don't think that education has to be enjoyable in order to be effective, if we can make it enjoyable, we should, because it is likely to be more effective if it's fun and enjoyable and engaging than if it's drudgery and we have to exercise self-discipline to force ourselves to learn something. Your camera cut out halfway through your speech. So let's reboot your camera, but then I'll jump in because I've got a lot to say. All right. Sorry about that. No, no, it doesn't matter. It's fine. It. Hold on. We, I didn't want to, I didn't want to cut you off or interrupt you. And so we'll just fix it up uh, in the recording.
There we go. Now I can see again. All right. There we go. I had hid the screen so that I don't, otherwise I stare at the screen and not at the lens. So I hid the screen, but I think sure. I turned on like a timeout function or something. No, no, it's fine. No problem. Okay. Okay. Now we're getting into some of the really exciting things because I have actually a lot to say on this. And I think, you know, you used a phrase in there that just resonates so well with me, Joshua. And it was this, I want to have it all. I totally get that. Like, I absolutely understand that on every single level. I want to have it all. You know, I homeschool my kids. I work from home. I have a stay at home wife. I want my kids to be around a family. I want them to be around, not just me and my wife, but we brought my mother down. My mother lives with us full time as well. So we've got multiple generations. We're doing multiple languages. We're traveling with the kids. We're doing music and martial arts and reading and mathematics and so many different things. And I want it all. And I want it all for my kids. And, you know, when you just said 50,000 hours, 18,000 hours are normally spent in a government run school. It's like, holy moly, that is a ridiculous amount of time. Now, some people seem to think that it's okay. It's just a given that the first 18 years of your life are a complete write-off. And, you know, you have to be in public education and in a present sentence. And it's like, no, I mean, that's your life. Like, as far as anyone can convince me, we got, we got one life to live. Even if, you know, longevity, and we're going to be here for 100 years, 150 years, amazing. I still don't want to waste, you know, 50,000 hours of it of my life or of my children's life. So I'm so grateful that I got out of public education at such a young age and that I had the courage and the bravery to stand up at that age and say, no, this is wrong. This doesn't work for me and it is wrong. And I pulled myself out of the system. Did I know at that time that I would have everything figured out and I would build a multi-million dollar business and do all these amazing things? No, I didn't. But I knew the situation was wrong. And I know it's wrong for my kids as well. And so therefore, when you know that there is an alternative out there, you know that there are other options out there. It's like, what are you waiting for? Like, have it all. Like, I want everybody who is listening to today's program to have it all. Like, you legit can. And I know that some of the excuses are going to come back and be like, well, you know, we can't afford it, or my wife can't be a stay-at-home, or I can't be a stay-at-home dad or anything like that. Well, I mean, go listen to the, the last 287 episodes of this program, which have given you real-life practical solutions of having a better life overseas. Because money and time and all of these things, there's a lot of solutions there, like domestic help. Like, I don't also need to be a stay-at-home, um, you know, be run a... Sorry. I don't also need to homeschool my kids and run a business from home and clean the house and scrub toilets. Like I have someone who helps me with that. You know, I have people in my life that assist me through things so that I can have the best of the best and I can allow someone else to do it in an honest and an ethical way and pay them fairly and help them support themselves on these things. And I don't know. It's just like, you, you legit can have it all if you have the bravery and the gumption to go out there and make it happen. Absolutely. I think one of the most powerful things about the world we live in in 2024 is any individual who is experiencing some particular way of living or has some success in something can easily share his or her story with the world and say, Here's how I did it, or here's how I'm doing it. And that leads and is leading to an incredible compounding of knowledge and insight. And I'm excited about the world that we live in because this is my hobby is I think, what's the problem? How do I want, what do we want to learn? And we can go out and in today's world, we can find world-class experts that will teach us the best way to learn it. And it genuinely is possible to have it all, but the foundation has to be commitment and a desire. You mentioned that not everybody can homeschool. I would agree that not everybody can homeschool. I would also say not everybody should homeschool. 
There are situations let me, let in which- Let me butt in here. Let me Go absolutely ahead. interrupt you. Not everybody can homeschool and not everybody should homeschool, but I guarantee you it is a higher percentage of people than you would think. And probably chances are, if you're listening to this, it is available to you. You're still in my thunder because that's exactly what I was going to say. What I can, all I can tell you is that I never, I never even considered any other option. I never would consider any other option. And because it's important to me, if I were caught in an impossible situation, I were suddenly found bankrupt and my wife died and I've got all these children, I would arrange my life in some way so that I could homeschool my children. Now we might be living in a $2,000 RV, which I have parked on some oil property out in Texas so I can be a gate guard. And my children might be a little bit feral because they're all, all homeschooling themselves. And we might do very hardcore unschooling and nothing like what I do now. But to me, it's just been obvious that the ability to do it comes primarily down to your motivation and your commitment. And where there's a will, there's a way. And I could list you a dozen examples right here, right now, that in many cases would solve 99% of the problems that people say, I can't homeschool. If you wanted to homeschool, you could find a way. So I'll acknowledge that maybe there's 1% out there who can't. And there may be get 20% who shouldn't or 50%. I don't know the number. But anybody who genuinely wants to and is committed could find a lifestyle structure that allows you to achieve your goals. Well, even let's go real practical here. Okay. So you're listening to this episode and you're in California or you're in New York or you're in one of these states in the United States or Toronto or anything like this, right? You're listening to this and going, well, I don't have enough money or I need to work two part-time jobs. Okay. When you move down to Costa Rica in your case or Panama in my case, cost of living can often be drastically less. When you add on to that, insurance costs are usually one third to one quarter to one fifth of what they are back home. And then once you don't have a tax bill anymore or your taxes are drastically reduced, as a Canadian, we can completely get rid of our tax bill to the Canadian government if done correctly. As an American, there's $125,000 of earned income that you can earn legally and exclude if you move overseas. If you have a spouse, it's a doubling effect. You're now talking about a quarter of a million dollars where you don't have to pay tax on it legally. And down here in a lot of these countries in the Caribbean and Latin America, these countries are not going to tax you either. So those are absolutely concrete things that you can do by being an expat, which will solve the argument or solve the problem of not having enough money or having enough money, but not having enough time because you have to do so much extra work. Like I often said to people, you know, go to your boss and tell them that you want to, instead of taking a raise, you want to get less money. You want to lower your salary, but you're going to be moving overseas and you're going to be working remotely instead. You're going to make your own hours. You're going to do asynchronous work. If you, you know, even cut your salary by a third, you know, but you didn't have the insurance, the taxation and the high standard uh, the high cost of living. What could you do with that time instead that you would normally dedicate to work? It's like you could absolutely homeschool your kids. If it is important to you, you can make it happen. Full stop. Like you said, in 99% of the cases, I think you can. A story. A couple of weeks ago, I was visiting with a lady that was a new acquaintance of mine. She was from Jamaica. She was a school teacher in Jamaica. She has a son. The son's father was never in the picture. And she was extremely worried about the future of her son. As a single mom, she decided that if she stayed in Jamaica, it was almost certain that her son would wind up in a gang, which would destroy his life and possibly end his life. And she didn't want that to happen to her son. And so she had to get out of Jamaica. Now, of course, she could have gone and done various things in different places. But in her case, she really wanted to be a missionary. And so she was able to build 
a little bit of missionary support for her work. She went and joined a Christian missionary organization and she lives in Latin America. I would guess her monthly income from her supporters is six or $700 a month, but she lives adequately in Latin America on a very modest lifestyle and she homeschools her son. And over the last three or four years, she and her son have been in, I think something like nine or 10 countries all around the world with her mission work. And she's found a way to do it. I can't think of an extreme, a more extreme example than what I've just said, a single mom from a, an impoverished nation who has to flee for the safe, health and safety of her family, and she found a way. So there are always ways to accomplish these goals when we want to. Very well said. Very well said. Thank you.